Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, I was just here, but this time I'm not giving a talk with someone. I'm handing it off to Paul, uh, who is going to, this is sort of the Ansible and OpenStack 101 talk. So if you've used Ansible or OpenStack, I'm assuming that you probably have heard of OpenStack if you've bothered to come out to this event, uh, but maybe you don't know much about Ansible or you're just figuring out how to get started with Ansible and OpenStack together, then this is the talk for you and, and Paul's kind of awesome. He works in uh, infra, and I'm going to hand it off to him, and I'm going to shut up so we have time to actually talk. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Hello, hello. Is this thing on? Yeah? OK. So I'm going to keep this short because we're short on time. Um, we're not that short on time. I mean, oh, OK. You've got OK. okay. So um, we'll Monty up later after this, after class. Okay. So basically, um, I wasn't originally scheduled to give this talk, so um, uh, hopefully, I can try to make it through and, and keep it as basic as 101 and, and with Ansible and OpenStack. Uh, so basically, a uh, quick thing, this is what I do. I work on the OpenStack project uh, on the infrastructure team. I've uh, basically been with Red Hat since 2015. I've been contributing to OpenStack since 2012. Uh, and I'm not the community Ansible architect. I, that's a typo. Okay, so the agenda, what we're doing here today, um, I'm not going to cover this because it's just basically reading. So this is basically the summary of what we're going to try and do. Um, so why are we here? So basically, I'm hoping everybody's here because they either want to use Ansible and they want to use OpenStack, and maybe they want to use Ansible and OpenStack together. Um, either you don't know what Ansible it is, or you don't know what OpenStack is. I'm going to give some very basic summaries of what those tools are and, and provide a very simple demo, uh, leveraging the stuff that Monty and um, Robin talked about in the previous talk, uh, demoing uh, some, a tool that we use in OpenStack Infra called uh, Ansible Role Cloud Launcher. Um, so IT is difficult. I'm sure everybody knows that. Um, the whole concept of Ansible is Ansible makes um, things much easier to, um, to manage. Uh, Ansible is constructed in a way where it's very basic. It's basically task-based task execution as opposed to other tools such as um, Puppet, which is my background previously, which uh, you would write in a, um, in, a, in a manifest, and Puppet would, would take this raw data in and magically mangle it together and try to optimize how to deploy it. Ansible really is uh, first in, first out of, of how you write your tasks. And that can be good or bad because it could be um, some dangerous things that you might run into depending on what you're doing. Uh, so the concept of OpenStack is make IT less difficult by delivering res resources on demand. So if um, people who do not use OpenStack, uh, one of the main benefits of it is, is you can basically say to the cloud, give me something, a server uh, with so much RAM and so on and so forth, and in theory it should be returned back to you relatively quickly. We're talking minutes, maybe hour. Uh, previously, <clears throat> data centers, uh, 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 requesting resources from your IT, like we're talking weeks, days, months, so on and so forth. Um, but basically, clouds are difficult. And this is what, uh, hopefully, some of the, the steps that we're going to talk about here that kind of makes them a little bit simpler. Um, so this is what a cloud looks like. Uh, and this is probably something that goes really well with the talk that was just previously, hap previously happened with Monty and Robin, where uh, Monty talked about the library called Shade, which we're going to talk about in demo today. Uh, Shade hides all that from you. Um, it's just very simple. Give me, get, you know, post, return, so on and so forth. And Monty and the team of Ansible, Ricky, and so on and so forth do a wonderful job uh, writing Shade and writing uh, Ansible modules to, uh, as an operator or as an end user, you don't have to think about that. You just say, give me something, and it, it should come back. So, um, yeah, so we basically need a tool that's flexible for you know, all the things that we're doing here for OpenStack operations. And that's, you know, simple enough to get the job done. And this is where something like Ansible really comes into, into play with it. Um, so why Ansible? So anybody not used Ansible before? Just a quick raise of hands. Oh, okay, wow. Of those people that are raising their hands, how many of you want to use Ansible? Yeah, okay, so you're here to learn about it, and that's great. So basically, Ansible is a configuration management tool for orchestration, application development. Um, it's basically a lot of things, and uh, it's kind of like um, you know, nothing else out there, in you know, my opinion. So basically, the idea of Ansible is um, 
from my laptop, I can actually get it installed in literally a second, well, not a second, however fast my internet is, um, and start running it. Uh, other tools, um, which you know, I don't necessarily have to get into, but other tools um, sometimes require agents on the node to be pre-installed, and then there's this server-client relationship that needs to be established before you can even use the configuration management. Um, with Ansible, the only thing that you need is basically SSH. And if you've created your server appropriately with networking and SSH keys and passwords and so on have been um, uh, pre-installed either via boot process or, or some other cloud config drive or, or cloud init or something like that, you can start automating that server and basically automate all the things. So um, Ansible is simple but flexible. So it's basically Python, all open source, uh, no DSL, so things like Puppet, where you had to express your, stop, uh, express your manifests in specific ways, establish dependencies, and then when Puppet compiled it, it, it automatically did things. Um, it was great, but sometimes if you re-ran that task, it wouldn't do those things in the same order and maybe expose another pro problem and so on. Um, Ansible, basically, everything is done as a task, one after one, serial serialized or paralyzed against multiple servers, multiple, multiple clouds. Um, basically uses SSH, which you can use keys, Kerberos, so on and so forth, passwords, no passwords, I recommend public keys. And it's literally, well not literally, but it, it is easy to use and easy to learn. Um, I find um, if you understand YAML, that's your bar of entry into Ansible. Um, other tools usually required you maybe to um, learn a programming language such as Ruby, and then understand the, the DSL of, of its constructs and so on and so forth. Um, YAML, uh, if you use it long enough, it seems pretty simple to, to express and use, um, but that's really what you need to learn is YAML. You don't need to know Python. I mean, it helps if you know Python because you can do more things, but YAML really is the only thing that you need to know to use Ansible. Okay, so what is OpenStack? Um, OpenStack is this massive project, basically give me resources, virtualized, bare metal. I'm not, don't necessarily have to go into the deep guts of it, but basically it's for public, private clouds, uh, open, running on open APIs, uh, shared infrastructure, uh, rapidly changing, growing, and, and, and so on. It's this massive thing, it's got bare metal, you name it, there's probably an OpenStack project for it. Um, but it is complicated. Um, and that's where things like Monty was talking about, library called Shade, the modules that Ricky and other uh, people at Ansible work on, try to keep that as simple uh, for the end user or the operator to actually use. Um, so Ansible reduces the complexity of OpenStack, but OpenStack keeps it flexible. Um, so they kind of go hand in hand, and you can see uh, uh, based on uh, what Monty was talking about and his passion of the two topics of Ansible and OpenStack, there's really a really good um, path moving forward between those pro two projects and, um, you know, they're, I don't want to say depending on each other, but it, there's a really good fit there between Ansible and OpenStack and operators tend to love using those two tools hand in hand. Okay, so automation for everyone. Let me check the time here. Um, so basically, we're gonna talk about three groups of users. So there's the consumers, the operators, and the deployers. So consumers basically build instances, connect resources with OpenStack APIs and dashboards, usually called end users, okay? Operators, operators was something I would probably classify myself as. We are the people that manage the cloud resources for you. So we will uh, rack new servers to expand more compute resources, add in uh, Ceph capacity for storage, so on and so forth. And then there's the deployers, there's, those are the people that um, uh, actually you know, maintain and deploy and upgrade OpenStack over the long haul. So how can Ansible help? So basically Ansible is easy for automation, so no need for custom code. Um, this is where things like Shade and the modules that Monty were talking about come into play. Uh, basically operators, are, they're created with the same task tools and playbooks. And uh, deployers, basically Ansible is used already by ma many OpenStack clouds. So um, there's a maturity there that is somewhat backed up by the, um, what's it called? The 
uh, the OpenStack Foundation does a survey every year or every six months about the project in itself, and there's one question in there that they always ask of how you're deploying OpenStack, what tool you're using, and year over year, it's a really interesting metric, and I, I couldn't find the slide in time to inject here, but ye, basically every time it happens, Ansible just explodes more and more. So as, as we're moving forward, Ansible appears to be the dominant tool, at least for OpenStack, uh, that's kind of, again, I don't want to say one out the battle because who knows what the next one's going to be, but has, has already established itself as the clear winner. Um, and I think that's really because it's simple to use and um, it, it, it's simple to use and it's simple to uh, think about how to use in production. You can take a playbook, you can look at it, you can look at the tasks, see how they flow one to one. Other tools, you have to do this mental map in your brain for something in to something out. Okay, so enough talk, let's build something. So, I think I got about 20 minutes left. Does that sound about right? So, <laughs> we're gonna do it live. Okay, so the scenario. This was the scenario that I was gonna try and do, but um, we're actually gonna, only gonna do parts of this because, uh, like I said, I don't have raw, I'm not an admin on the cloud that I'm doing this on, I'm a user. So there's certain things like I can't do, like I can't create a new project and I can't create a new user because I don't have admin credentials to do that. Um, I could set up a network and a subnet, but there's actually one already set up. Um, I'm going to add some SSH keys and I'm going to create the, the security groups. And then basically the building of the instance and launching the website, I'm going to mm, use a different tool with that, which is um, basically node pool and I'll show you how all that works together, hopefully. Um, so live demo time. I forget what my, my next slide is, okay. So let's see here. Okay, so I have a cloud. Um, uh, so I, I probably should um, explain a little bit of this. I have a clouds.yaml file already created, which contains my username and my password and my cloud that I'm using. Uh, the cloud that I have is basically, uh, Let me see here. So it's basically a cloud that I have at Red Hat for testing that I use. And and it's not secure based on that here. Okay, so this is the cloud. Has anybody not seen this before? This is the dashboard for OpenStack. So this, if you were an end user and not using APIs and you wanted to create yourself things in OpenStack, this is probably what you would use, uh, minus the Red Hat branding on the top here. Uh, so right now, so basically I have an instance already running. It's called Win Windmill. I use that for some uh, testing purposes. Uh, so these are the instances, volumes, and so on and so forth. Um, what I'm going to show right now is basically access control. And the reason I'm showing this is that uh, for the purpose of this demo, imagine that this is a new cloud that we in OpenStack Infra want to bring online because we're adding capacity for testing. Um, so like, um, like Monty was saying, we have a cloud city host, we have Rackspace, we have Internap, we have uh, Vex host, we have basically 12 clouds across, um, 12 regions across eight clouds across the planet all over the place. And Instead of me manually going in here every time and doing this of like, oh, okay, I need to make sure that all my um, access groups are set up to allow SSH and so on. This is how we used to do it um, because every cloud provider ships something totally different for their default settings. And as you bring a new node on, you would forget this over time and you would try to SSH into the system and then you would start screaming and cursing because you're trying to figure out why there's no network connectivity and it's because, well, the default group here is dropping all packets inbound and so on and so forth. So what we have is basically we have this, this, um, this file called cloud layouts and this is public. This is our public data that we, that we run and it's um, basically the configuration for the, for the tool called cloud launcher that Monty talked about previously and that Ricky 
Ricky, put your hand up. This guy right here, next speaker, helped, uh, basically wrote. It was basically his idea to, to do this. So the concept is we have these profiles. In a profile, we have a, um, a project. Basically, anytime we do CI, we have two tenants, or I guess not a tenant, somewhere, two projects. We have a project called OpenStack CI, which is where we put things like mirrors uh, for our AFS backend. So we mirror packaging, Python packages. Um, we have a, a proxy now to Docker for Docker registry and for some other uh, RDO artifacts. And then we have another project called OpenStack Zool, and this is where we actually launch all of the VMs in, in this cloud, or in our clouds. Uh, so again, these are the security groups that I was talking about, uh, the default one, and basically what we want to do from uh, our point of view is we want it to be open. We don't want any sort of uh, anything blocking any traffic because, well, we really don't care about that. We expose these instances to testers, uh, developers like yourself or whoever the, in the project, and we want them to have full root access, unblocked networking, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, this is a key pair, so we uh, create uh, about eight, SSA, eight public keys that get dropped in. So last one's mine. The one above that is uh, David True's, Ian. Ricky's is in here somewhere. Uh, is yours in here, Ricky? Uh, anyways, oh yeah, there you are, right here, you're this guy. Um, so this allows all of our infrastructure um, root admins to be able to SSH into these machines for troubleshooting and so on and so forth. And again, um, on certain clouds, we actually do have admin permi permissions. I'll show that a little farther. Uh, basically, we as OpenStack Infra run a cloud, it's called Infra Cloud, and we have two regions. Uh, chocolate and strawberry, no, stro chocolate and vanilla, soon to be strawberry. And then we have a, a blue box cloud that we actually have a min access to. And the same thing, we set up some simple roles and users and so on. So again, um, I can't run these on this cloud because I'm not, I don't have admin access. So anything below this line here to clouds uh, represents to me admin tasks that require admin credentials. I didn't have time to get access to a cloud or stand up a cloud that had that. But um, hopefully what I'm going to show and talk about um, really kind of expresses how this works. And then lastly, these are our clouds. And like, uh, like Monty had said before, all of this is built on Shade, which uses uh, something called OpenStack, clou OpenStack Cloud Config, which is the clouds.yaml file. And these are all representations of the public clouds that we have. And you can see there's no usernames, passwords in here because this is uh, publicly available image, uh, public uh, available uh, information on our GitHub or on our Git repositories that we as Infra use to manage all of our cloud resources. So with that in mind, this is my uh, very simple, it's again to save myself copy paste, it has everything the same as the last except we're only gonna run it on one cloud, which is this cloud, OS Lab, which is an internal cloud at Red Hat. So, uh, before I can do that, so the command that I would use is Ansible Playbook. Uh, hold on. So Ansible Playbook, of course, doesn't find it. So what I'm gonna show you is how to actually bootstrap your Ansible book, or Ansible laptop here. So I'm gonna use something called um, uh, virtual environments from Python. So virtual env, so we're just gonna call this one test. Actually, we'll call it Ansible. Oh. Okay, so I've just created myself a sandbox environment in Python. So basically, I'm going to source that um, because I don't wanna contaminate my laptop with um, uh, dependencies. Okay, so now for our in intensive purposes, I have a, a straight sandbox environment. So now I'm gonna install Ansible, which is basically pip install Ansible. Goes out to the web, downloads it. This is, uh, this is it, so done. Ansible is installed. So if I then did Ansible, uh, Ansible playbook version, Ansible is installed, okay? That's it, I can now run this test. Well, almost, I actually need shade, so pip install shade. 
Again, publicly packaged, blah, blah, blah. Installs, downloads all the OpenStack libraries, compiles them if needs them, and done. So now I can run the command. And if I did it right, basically, I should probably do this. Actually, before I, before I run it, let me show you the, the playbook. That's the one step that I forgot. So this is our playbook. This is the basic minimum that we need to tell, um, can, anybody, can everybody see that? I see some people squinting. No? Really small? Uh, how, do you, how do you? Control plus. Let's see that. Where, control shift plus. Hey, that's better, right? So that's basically our playbook that we're going to use to parse that YAML file and publish all of these changes to our one cloud. Um, so basically, we're going to run this on uh, local hosts, implying my laptop. It's going to use a connection of local, which means it's not going to try to SSH back to itself. Otherwise, I'd have to set up SSH keys to allow it to, to access it. Um, gather facts. Well, I don't need to gather any facts. Facts are part of Ansible. Think of it as uh, you know tidbits of information that imply what the operating system is running, um, uh, IP addressing, so on and so forth, kernel versions, so on. Um, we don't need that. And then basically we're just saying include this default rule called role cloud launcher, which um, is right here. Uh, again, it's public on uh, git.openstack.org. And it's, uh, it's basically a series of tasks that we use to create, ta like create things in OpenStack. And as an end user, you don't have to worry about that because the role is already set up to do this and we try to keep it working and so on. So yeah, so if my demo works, uh, 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 this is gonna be the command and make sure, if it doesn't work, I can scoot off the cage here because I've run out of time. So basically, ignore the warnings. Okay, I'm gonna make this smaller. So what is it, control shift minus? No, My, control minus, thank you. So basically, again, ignore the warnings because, well, I don't know what they mean. No, I do, but we don't, we don't care. Um, so yellow implies that something's changed. So you can see we've created our infra keys because it's called, I don't have a little pointer here, but the first line says infra root keys and that's blobbing out all the eight or 10 uh, keys into config drive so that when we boot an instance, the instance pulls this data out of OpenStack into the local VM and then allows the root, it creates a uh, SSH authorized file that SSH uses for root user. And then basically, um, the green command means that it did not change, but it ran successfully, and it has um, basically wide open default security. And that's because I tested this beforehand and nothing changed. So if we went back to here, we should now basically see under uh, keys, key pairs. Uh, uh, did I show you that before? So it, it's created my key pair for me, okay? Now, uh, again, uh, imagine I had admin access that allowed me to create networking uh, or I was provisioning a new tenant for new users. The whole idea is, is, is it literally took me less than a minute to install Ansible to install uh, Shade. It took me, obviously, time before this demo to express all the information in YAML, which is um, this file. Where did it go? This file here. So obviously, this, as an end user, this is what you care about, because this is what your cloud, all your clouds are gonna contain. And like I said, we in OpenStack Infra Leverage this because we're always bringing new clouds on and it's very simple to run. Um, and yeah, and the cool thing is, is if we went in here and let me see, if for whatever reason I wanted to um, add something new, 
So security group, uh, foo, or goo, foo. And basically, I'm just going to uh, copy this. Is this going to work? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, to paste. And then I did to. Oh. Well, you get the idea. I'm, I'm fumbling. You get the idea. I can modify this file, rerun the command. Nothing's going to change in the original section. It's going to add me in the new section. And like I said, as an operator, I love this because I don't have to touch web. It's reproducible. We can then take this file, source it into Git, do code review on it, and, and share it between our team, which is distributed um, around the world. Uh, so I think, oh man, I still got like 20 minutes? Uh, any questions so far? Like, feel free to interact here. No? Okay, well, I'll move on. Yeah, so basically, uh, like, nobody has to come in on Saturdays or Sundays or whatever. Ansible can just do this. You can store it in Git, store it in configuration. Not to say you can't do that with other tools, but, like, we didn't have to set up any agents on, on these nodes. They, or in this cloud, I'm sorry. Um, tool like, um, like uh, let's say, Puppet or Chef or SaltStack, because it does not have a integration with Shade, you would have to write all of that business logic to actually go out and do all that. And you're more than happy, and if you want to do that, that's great, because it's a great experience, but these are tools that you can just download today and just start using your clouds. Yes. So the question is, Ansible uses SSH, and what do you do if you have Ansible? So that's a good question, because I've never used Windows to do that. But so basically, what, what Ricky's saying is, Ansible has this con construct or concept of a connection. And that connection can be SSH. It can be a local loopback adapter. It can be the driver for Windows, which, I, again, I, I don't know what the name is. But another tool that, you, another thing that you can do is there's the concept of a CH root. So people who build images or build something create a CH root, and then you can basically get into that CH root and do things in it. Well, Ansible has that ability as well. So if there's, um, if there's something that you need to do to a remote item that Ansible doesn't, obviously you write the new connection for it. But at the heart of it, it is SSH. I'm sure Windows supports SSH, so you should, in theory, be able to use SSH for it. But I've not touched a Windows machine in 20, you know, 15 years, so unfortunately I do not know the answer to that question. Yes, sir? Um, so the question is, how does Ansible compare to Heat, which is basically an orchestration, Heat is an orchestration engine within OpenStack. So it's kind of a, um, so my personal opinion is Ansible is better than Heat. And the reason that Ansible is better than Heat is because I can very easily put Ansible on my desktop or my laptop and start orchestrating things from outside the cloud. So my, my cloud was remote. For Heat to work, if, if I wanted to do this same demo with Heat, I would need Heat running in this cloud. And as an end user, I can't install that. I need to then go to my operations team or my admins and say, I would like to use Heat. Can you install Heat for OpenStack that allows me to leverage it? And there are cases where cloud providers do that, and there are cases where they don't do that. So, the big difference from my point of view is while heat is orchestration and it probably does some different, no problem, different things than Ansible, 
it's all limited on the fact that you need it running in your cloud. And as somebody who works on the OpenStack infrastructure team who uses um, multiple clouds around the globe that are donated to us freely, we can't go back to them and say, hey, well, thanks for the cloud. By the way, we need our orchestration tool in the cloud to do it. Um, it would be great if, if, if all the clouds you know, did heat across, then maybe we would consider using it. But Ansible isn't tied to OpenStack in that way, and it's more flexible that I can, like I said, I can get it on this laptop and start using it. Heat, there's an install dependency issue that needs to be addressed. So hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions? And I'll keep going. Yes, sir. revert that change? Right, so the question is, does Ansible offer a, some sort of a state engine to ensure that your, your change on the remote, remote node is always that change? So yes, so um, it does, but not inherent, like you have to express that sometimes in your playbook. So something like Puppet where you would always say, this file has to exist with this permission, and every time Puppet ran, it would go and check that file to make sure it run. Well, Ansible, you could, in theory, bypass that step depending on previous check conditions. So if you write your playbook to always say, this file needs to be created, file A needs to be created, ensure file A has permission X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth, Ansible will allow you to enforce those states. But because Ansible is so freely and task-driven, you can actually run Ansible with only certain parts of a playbook. It's, it's something called tags, or uh, you can only include a specific portion of a playbook. And that's where I say it kind of gets dangerous because you can bypass parts of your installs depending on maybe you want to make things faster and so on. So yes, Ansible will enforce those things if you remote it. If I, if I went into this cloud right now, and I deleted this key for InfraRoot, and then I reran it, it'll create it again for me. Yes, you need, yes. So yes, Ansible always has to run. It's not uh, like a persistent daemon that's running all the time and monitoring your file system. Yes? Sorry, can you say that again? Can you run Ansible in no-op mode? Yes, most certainly you can. So there's a no-op flag, it will show you what's being run and so on. It's actually a good, I think we, that's what we use in testing for some of our playbooks. We do a very simple no-op mode just to make sure that Ansible compiles and that the YAML is in the proper format. It has four spaces instead of four tabs. So yes, there is a no-op um, ability in Ansible, Ansible playbook. Uh, so, okay, so I think, I mean, I don't have much more here, so. Um, so basically what I wanted to say was one of the use cases that we in OpenStack use is the uh, something called Zool, which I believe there's gonna be a lightning talk. Are we done? No. Oh, so I think Clint might be talking about Zool very shortly here. So Zool is a project driven by OpenStack Infra, which Ultimately, we're trying to, everybody, people know what Jenkins is, yes, Jenkins CI. So we have taken Jenkins out of our system and we've replaced it with Ansible, 100% Ansible. So now we're actually driving tests with Ansible and it's a great way because, um, um, A, it's super cool because, you know, it's super fast, but um, it, it, it really is a great, like, task engine, task executor and we don't necessarily need to rewrite that from scratch. We can go to the community, use something like Ansible, and then we as OpenStack only have to focus on the Zool part about writing the Zool code. We, we, we pass that to Ansible to do all the testing of the playbook. Yes? Is there a schedule for that? A schedule for Zool? Uh, is there a schedule for, uh, oh, a schedule. 
Oh, sorry, scheduler, yes. So Zoom. Okay, I just got told I'm getting kicked off the stage. But yes, there is a scheduler. Um, there's, uh, basically there's two concepts. Zool schedules things, and then we have a Zool executor which runs the Ansible playbooks. So I can talk more about it afterwards, but I really am talking into another presentation that's gonna be coming about it. But it, it, the concept is Zool grabs all the information from Git, we then pass it to our executor, which is basically a wrapper to Ansible. Ansible then triggers everything into the remote node, and we deploy Git repos, and then we start running tests and so on and so forth. So I'm, 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 that's the super high level, and I'm happy to go into more depth with it and, and show, show logs and so on. And then basically the last one I know is basically Ansible OpenStack, which is a community in OpenStack, which is leveraging Ansible big time. And then these are some projects in OpenStack, Cola, Bifrost, which you heard about earlier. Earlier, Ursula is an IBM project, and then there's some Ansible OpenStack security. And how to get started, basically read the manual. There's these perfectly awesome docs at docs.ansible.org. And then pound Ansible on Freenode for all your Ansibles. And that's it. So Ricky, you're up. So thank you. <laughs>